let's talk about the last piece for tonight on the strategic agenda, and that's targeting and segmentation. This is a really fun way of thinking about this, and that is, you know, what's the perfect startup storm? What's going to get your business just immediately to the front of people's minds? And I would say it's going to be three things, actually. It's not just having a great product, a great idea with a, a breakthrough value prop. It's what we talked about last time. It's also having a disruptive business model that makes it unbelievably easy for people to engage you. And then, this is the third and most important piece for this <coughs> section, it's finding this new market opportunity where at this particular point in time, there isn't anybody else addressing this particular area of need. And if you can do that, you're in the perfect storm. You're in a great place to go make an impact. But why also does it make a, a difference beyond that? Well, people typically think about segmentation about as targeting a market. That's important for product market fit. But it's also, if you think about it, important for packaging and distribution. Uh, because if you pick a particular product that's luxury, high value, like Chanel, that, that uh, you were just hearing from Adam about, it's going to be sold very differently than thinking about something that is a knockoff t-shirt that comes from Taiwan that doesn't have a brand that's obviously going to go through you know, mass outlets in retail for just broad reach. So it's actually incredibly important to think about all of the segmentation aspects in terms of all of the ways you'll go to market. And ultimately, everything I would say in marketing depends on getting a good targeting and segmentation. So I'll give you a sense of, of this using a diagram that you're that I just put up, but that also relate it back to what you probably hear a lot of. In this diagram, what I'm really saying is if you have a value proposition that could apply to this whole marketplace, that's okay. But wouldn't it be better if what you could do is get it really focused on a small segment here where the amount of coverage that you had to have was a lot smaller? So think about that for a second. If your value prop has to reach thousands of people and apply to all of them, it's going to be a lot of work for a startup. But if you could target it down to one person, and you could say, oh, I know that person really, really well, and I know exactly what they need, it would be very easy to meet their needs. So somewhere in between is what we're trying to find. And for those of you who weren't here for the value prop session, we talked about a number of things, finding discontinuous, defensible, and disruptive value props. Those are all important. But we also talked about finding people who had needs that were unworkable, unavoidable, and urgent. And we had one under there that is highly relevant to targeting, which is in an underserved market where those needs aren't being met today. I'm going to add one last one, which is, again, this notion of uniqueness. Finding something where you can uniquely serve that need. So now, what we're looking at in this diagram is you've got a unique value proposition that can meet an underserved need. You're going to end up with a very unique, uh, in a unique position as a startup to be successful. Because other people haven't identified that segment, and other people haven't got as focused on it to come up with a unique proposition, you're going to be better set up for success. There are people who obviously have other lingos out there. So I'll use the lean startup lingo. So you might use this if, if this is more comfortable to you. Most people have heard of the minimum viable product. Actually, let's get a show of hands. Who has heard of MVP? OK, good. So lots of people are reading that material. Well, minimum viable product is one thing. But as you hear in that discussion, of what it takes to build a minimum viable product. Again, the same principle applies. If you're trying to meet a minimum viable product for an entire market, that's going to be a much bigger product than if you pick a small segment of it to actually meet the needs. And so again, the smaller the segment you pick, the easier it's going to be for you to successfully cover it with your first minimum viable product. So look for that intersection. And this is why segmentation is so important. Now, what is segmentation? <coughs> One of the biggest mistakes people make is to just go down what I would describe as the sort of classic thinking of, oh, well, it's pick a vertical. It's finance or it's government. Yeah, that might be one way. But the really key thing to look for is what the customer's needs are and lining those up and finding ultimately a segment according to a customer set of needs that are consistent from customer to customer in this particular segment. Why that's so important is that if you can find five customers who have exactly the same need, that to me is a great segment. Why? Because if you hit the first guy, you know you're going to get the next four. And then this comes into play, which is incredibly important. As you know, I'm a student of Jeffrey Moore. He'll be here for the end. He talks about this almost religiously through his book. Once that first customer is met, has had their needs met, 
if they happen to know the next guy, in fact, if they're sitting right next to them, guess what they're going to want to do? They're going to want to reinforce that they bought a great product to their friend. And so they're going to reference each other. And then both of them are now talking about it, and the guy next to him is going to get infected by that enthusiasm. The next thing you know, he buys. And this is the whole point about reference selling. But you can't reference sell if you didn't segment up front with people who have consistent needs. Because if the guy sitting next to you has got completely different needs, you could go on and on and on about how the fact is you absolutely love these Nike sneakers, but the guy happens to like skiing, and he doesn't run because he's got some kind of a problem with his back. Not going to work. It's just not the same problem set. So segmentation is incredibly important for these two reasons. And ultimately, if you do it right, it leads to you dominating a segment which Jeffrey will typically talk about as a beachhead. And that initial beachhead is incredibly important because once you win a beachhead, once you win that initial segment, you can declare victory. You can say, we are the leader in providing sportswear for the amateur runner, et cetera, et cetera. And that point obviously becomes reinforcing of your brand and many other things we're going to talk about. So this is why segmentation is so important. It's particularly important for startups because you don't have the resource to compete broadly. So you're going to have to compete in a very focused way. So here's the mistake I want you to avoid. You'll often hear people tell you, I, I hate to say it, I hear it from uh, other people in the boardroom too often, oh, go vertical. You know, pick automotive or financial services or government. Well, by the way, those aren't verticals in my opinion. Financial services is a whole bunch of verticals, insurance, banking, et cetera. But even if you get that right, people then say, oh, just pick size. You know, are you going after consumer, SMB, or enterprise? Hmm? Those may be attributes that are important. But what I'm really trying to tell you to do is to go way beyond that and drill down to where there are problems and needs that are consistent. So for example, if you can find a process like regulatory approval, it might work across many different verticals. Pharma, financial services, government, they all have regulatory approval. They all need it. So sometimes people talk about this <laughs> as a diagonal way to, to segment a marketplace. In other words, you can go across verticals, but with a single problem set where you're meeting consistent needs. My point here is it's about the needs. It's about finding a way to get them really clearly identified at the center of what your value prop is that you're addressing. OK, so the next challenge I've, I've often heard from people is, OK, we can find needs that are consistent. If you remember the value prop, what I tried to get uh, people to understand was the significance of finding something that's urgent and critical. So here's an example for you to get a sense of this. Mobile is hot right now, so I get probably <laughs> Not an exaggeration, you know, a dozen or so mobile business plans a month. And you'd be amazed what I hear, which is, oh, yeah, we've got a market. It's the mobile professional market. OK. How big is the mobile professional market? I think it's probably pretty much as big as the market in general these days, because everybody would describe themselves in probably some industry or other as a mobile professional. OK, so let's drill down on that. We could look just and say, well, maybe it's office workers. but. I'm going to try to get you to see how if you get to think about this and double click on it, you can actually get to a really interesting market segment. So we could drill down and say, well, let's go after field workers versus white collar workers. We could say, let's go after services people rather than sales people. All these people are mobile professionals, by the way. And then let's pick a segment where they might have a real pain point like medical, medical equipment. So servicing medical equipment rather than just office equipment. And then and by the way, just to pause on that, so this would be, as an example, Pitney Bowes, and this would be Agilent, you know, to give you a sense of the way companies might fall into these things. And then if you're servicing medical equipment, why go after medical clinics if you could go after hospitals where you're not just dealing with a diagnostic problem, but you're dealing with critical care where lives are at stake? Now if you start to think about this, I'm able to say, if I can segment all the way down to this and identify, and I haven't gone into this full length of detail, but a set of well-defined similar needs where we solve critical care problems by enabling hospitals who need medical equipment 24-7 to work and provide the services people in the field with a solution that is mobile, OK, now I probably am doing something really valuable, really well-focused, and actually for a segment where if I can get those needs aligned, you'll have some real referenceability. Because you start saving lives for hospitals, people will talk about it. Uh, so that's the way to think about segmentation. There are many examples we could, we could work through in the workshop. And I hope you'll get a chance this evening to engage us on these ex examples. 
My last but most critical thing that I actually am going to say a prayer for is that each and every one of you, when you start your company, has the patience with yourself to work through focusing on what that segment is. My single biggest challenge, literally, with startups is that they try to do too much. In general, that's true. And as a startup, the challenge is almost invariably focus, just one word, focus on what you can do uniquely well for who. And that starts with the segmentation that we've just been talking about. It also leads to, as uh, I've just mentioned, the ability to create this beachhead where you can win. So I'm going to try to get you to ask, uh, sorry, to answer a question um, in your minds to, to realize this. And every time you're stuck making a decision as a startup, I'd encourage you to ask this question. How could you focus? And in the end, which would you rather? Would you rather expand on success or contract on failure? That's the question I want you to ask yourself every time you're at a junction about whether you should go big or get focused. Because I'll tell you what I see is the number one problem in startups. People try to do too much too soon, they end up doing none of it well, and they end up having to contract on failure, as opposed to the really good ones where people start with an incredibly small segment with a very focused minimum viable product. They meet that need uniquely well, and then even if it's only for one customer, they build on it and they get the next customer successful, and they reference that one to get the next one successful. So, it's my wish, my hope, and even my prayer for you that you find your focus and you figure out how to build on that to great, get your success going. Okay, enough from me on segmentation. What I'd like to do now is introduce uh, Demandware and Jameis, who lived this for real uh, as, a, as a business building an opportunity, which is huge, going after the, the massive e-commerce market. Jameis, how did you segment? So we were thinking through uh, as Michael said, a very, very large market, um, e-commerce, selling online. Who doesn't want to do it, right? Thousands and thousands of entities in North America alone who want to do it. And we were, at the time, about 22 people. So we started off with the concept of how do we really, how do we really focus in on a place where we can win? Um, we had a couple of guiding principles. Uh, one was get small, get big, or get out. The idea there being, Pick an area where it was really small and discreet and get really big within that niche. Or, if you couldn't do that, then move on to another niche. But the idea was pick an area where we could win and serve the market distinctly. Um, find a market that was small enough to be actionable. So to the concept of reference selling, find an area where everybody knew everybody else. It was small enough as a, at the size of company we were to really get in there and do something great. Um, but it was large enough that if we won, it was a meaningful enough company. Uh, and think about the questions about could we deliver in there with distinction? And if we succeeded, ultimately, would anybody care? Right? So it's one thing to win a niche, but would that niche open up other niches for you? So what we did um, is we thought about uh, not just even verticalized segments, but segments within segments within segments. Um, and at some point, I'll take you through, or you'll have to trust me on this, all the spreadsheets we went through to look at the market in a whole variety of different facets, not just the normal facets of revenue size and industry and all those things, but to really get into other sort of hard-to-find brand attributes around style or growth aspirations. Um, so what we did is we positioned the company around this concept of high-growth retailers and brands. Right? So even within the concept of retail, who were the highest and fastest growing retailers? And what are those segments that are most sort of applicable to us in our product? Um, and we really focused on those. And what we did is we wired account sets that we spent a long time over directly into our databases on go-to-market. So our sales team and our marketing teams, everyone was aligned around account sets that we knew were highly referenceable. Um, apparel, footwear, cosmetics, luxury home lifestyle above certain revenue sizes within certain segments where individuals knew other individuals. And we went after those people. And it started with one brand that we would win. But then as Michael was saying, that one brand would talk to their friends and say, I made a great choice. I chose this really nice startup. They're doing wonderful things. And words would spread from there. Um, it worked in cities where you would go after a particular brand in a particular city. And once that customer signed on and believed, then the whole city would open up for us. 
So this concept of sort of positioning with segmentation built in, wiring it right through our operations, and then it permeated everything we did on go-to-market. Um, and that's how we started from where we are, you know, and uh, yeah. Any questions while we got James up that? here? Thanks, Jameis. You're welcome. Because we're in a quiet period, having just gone public, we can't talk about the results of demandware and everything else, but you can go and look it up under the symbol of DWRE on NYSA now. <laughs> but thank you, Jameis, for uh, covering that. I will just tell you that, in my opinion, sitting on the board there from the earliest days in which we tried to figure this out, it was the segmentation that was critical to the early traction of the company and the repeatable success. Mm -hmm.